This is Mrs. Palmer Quay with an overview of Chapter 14 on Genetic Variation for Biology Students at Excelsior. You are not required to read this chapter and answer study questions, so this video will give you an overview of the most important information. This chapter in talking about genetic variation starts with talking about what is normal variance. What kind of variation do we normally have in our genes? Now remember that our, uh, everything that we are can be talked about in terms of certain traits, very obvious traits such as hair color or eye color or the amount of musculature you can develop, or less obvious traits so far as your ability in music or uh, perhaps in math. And these traits are produced by proteins, usually more than one. Proteins are produced by genes, found on your chromosomes. And genes may have different alleles. There may be two or more distinct ways that these genes will express the protein. If there are two different alleles that do not cause any disorder or any harm to you, it's a non-harmful alleles, and we'll just talk in the human standpoint here because our next chapter is on human variation. But non-harmful alleles are producing genetic variation. And having genetic variation within a population of any organism is a good thing because it allows for population adaptability and flexibility in changing environmental situations. We see this genetic variation in things like different types of chicken coloration. So I have this little diagram or um, slide I found down here that shows some different chickens. Or you think about dogs, the many different sizes and shapes and hair texture that you have in dogs. And so genetic variation, if you, you have a lot of genetic variation in a population, then if things change in the environment, if the temperature changes or a food supply has to change, then you can have, um, that population can survive because the people, or the organisms that have that trait that is better suited to that environment will be able to reproduce and continue on with the population. So that we depend on genetic variation for natural selection, for populations to survive in changing conditions. We also depend on genetic variation for human selection as we've gone on to make particular breeds of animals. We've been choosing from the traits that are already present in the population. In agriculture, the tendency has been to go to monoculture, one crop, one um, particular variety. And this can be a problem because then there's not genetic variation. Um, in the 1970s, we lost a lot of the corn crop because there was really only one type of corn plant that was predominantly planted, and a disease came through that that particular variety was not resistant to, and so most of the farmers lost their entire planting. If we had several different varieties of corn being planted, there might have been one in existence that was more resistant to that disease. So genetic variation is important for the success of any population of organism, be it plant or animal or human. So what does variation have to do with mutations? Well, really, all genetic variation is caused by differences in the DNA. You get different alleles because there's some slight difference in that gene. The one allele is slightly different than the other allele for the gene. In general, we talk about changes in DNA as being mutations. So on a very basic foundational level, genetic variation is caused by mutations. Now this is really going from a, a evolutionary standpoint where there was one perfect gene that you started out with and then things mutated and you had a second choice. From a creation standpoint, you know, we understand creatures to be have been created in their own kind and some of this genetic variation that was built in from the very beginning. Other things about mutations, mutations may appear spontaneously. They may occur just as a um, particular gamete undergoes meiosis in its production or within an organism during the mitosis of some cell. There may be mutations happening spontaneously or mutations may be passed on, may be inherited from parent to offspring. This is once the um, mutation has happened in the gamete, then that's when you see the inheriting. Mutations may not change the phenotype. Remember, this is how a gene is expressed looking from the outside. You can't tell what somebody's genetic makeup is precisely. It may, several different combinations may give you the same phenotype. So a mutation may not change the phenotype. We tend to call those silent mutations because you can't tell that they happen unless you investigate the genome. Mutations may be beneficial. I already mentioned the disease resistance with the corn. That if 
that would have been a beneficial mutation. Mutations may be harmful, which is what we see much, much more commonly, which then in your various genetic disorders that we'll be talking about with human genetics, those are caused by mutations that are harmful. And probably many of the mutations that happened are actually fatal, leading to a non-viable organism, and so we never see them expressed in a population at all because the organism doesn't ever survive to um, be born if it's an animal, to grow if it's a plant. There are several ways that you can talk about types of mutations. If the mutations occur in the germ cell or the gametes, or the cells that make the gametes really, then they are the type, as I said, that will be inherited, passed from parent to offspring, and then will be found in every cell of the offspring because, remember, you have an um, organism in sexual reproduction starts from one cell that is made from a gamete from each parent. If the mutation occurs in the body cells, this is known as a somatic cell mutation. This occurs in the organism after birth. It's not inheritable, and these are the types of mutations that we talk about as being potentially cancer-causing. It was a mutation that caused you to have a, you know, a cancer cell develop, because cancers are clones. They are um, cells that are mitotic that just continue to divide and divide and divide. From that one cell, you get a clone that becomes the tumor. We also can talk about mutations as to how much of the gene it affects. A point mutation only affects one nucleotide. And we're going to look at some specific examples of point mutations in a minute. And then chromosomal mutations, those affect large segments of chromosomes. An entire gene or several genes are affected. So point mutations. Point mutations are a change in one nucleotide. They can be caused by the substitution of one base for another or by inserting or deleting a base. So here we have an example of a substitution. In the original up here, we have G being um, bonded to C, as you would normally expect it. Down here, when this DNA was replicated, we had an A put in instead of the C. And these, can be, these types of substitutions can be triggered by various environmental chemicals that actually go in there and attack, well, attack is probably not the right word, but bind to the nucleotide bases and alter their properties so they appear to be something else. When you have a point mutation, then you are making a new codon. Remember, the codon is the group of three nucleotide bases that codes for a particular amino acid, and then the amino acids get connected together to make a protein. So if you change a codon, if you just have one substitution happen, you've got one new base in there that wasn't in the original, and so you get an incorrect amino acid. And the effect on the protein really depends on what kind of amino acid gets in there. So this little diagram uses these shapes to show the protein. So we've got a circle and a square and a triangle and an oval and a rectangle as the normal pattern. But over here, when we have this substitution in the amino acid codon, you've got a circle and a square, but then a star instead of a triangle, so that you have a different amino acid. If the amino acid has got a very different property than the original planned amino acid, such as we see in sickle cell anemia, then you can have a protein that has a, a, does not function correctly in the end result. And of course, sickle cell anemia, the hemoglobin protein has been affected by one different amino acid. There's one, it's a point mutation, one base change. And so instead of, I'm, I should have looked this up, but I think it's instead of a hydro amino acid, you have a hydrophobic amino acid, so what, that way or the other way around. And so the folding is not quite correct in the formation of the protein, and it doesn't behave correctly in the red, red blood cells, leading to the sickling nature, bending the um, normally round blood cell after the oxygen has been dropped off. If the protein replacement is something that's more similar to the original one, then you may not have such a drastic change in function. And you have a nonsense mutation, and in this case you have a ending, a termination of the protein, because there are certain codon combinations that say it's time to stop. We're all done with making this protein now, and if it shows up too soon, you end up with a truncated protein, as we see down here on the diagram. does not have enough amino acids. One of the causes of Duchenne mus muscular dystrophy is a nonsense mutation that causes a stop codon to be seen too soon in the development of the protein, and so the protein is non-functional because it's not big enough. 
And then silent mutations, as I mentioned, it doesn't cause any obvious change in the phenotype because either the new codon codes for the same amino acid. Remember, there were several different codes that were for any particular amino acids on that chart that we looked at back when we were doing protein uh, synthesis. Or if it's another amino acid but has very similar properties, we may not be able to tell that there has been a mutation in the genotype until, unless you did a, a genome analysis. But there is some evidence that silent mutations can cause subtle changes in function, and research is using silent mutations to try to develop some effective vaccines and to track some um, genetic properties, and so scientists are using these in some of their research techniques. All types of point mutations can cause a frame shift. If you remember, DNA is transcribed in a linear fashion. You start at point A and you read it until you reach the end. It's in a line. So if you do, if you change something in the middle, if you insert a new base or delete a base, it shifts the reading, the reading frame because you're not just reading one nucleotide at a time, but you're reading them in groups of three. You're reading the codons. So that every codon after the point of mutation will be different than the normal sense. So here we have an example of a frame, frame, shift, ah, frame shift mutation because of a deletion. So n normally this is the pattern of codons that we would see, these three base um, codes for the different amino acids. If we take out the guanine, then after the ATG codon, we have an entirely set different codons because we have shifted everything one place to the left. And you can see if you compare these amino acids that they are completely different. So frame shift mo mutation changes everything from that point of mutation forward in the um, development of the protein because it changes the codons. So in an insertion, the mutation, you have added extra DNA by putting in at least one base, sometimes more than one, a small chunk of chromosome can happen. These usually result in non-functional proteins or nonsense mutation because there are so many differences. A substitution mutation, mutation you're only changing one base, so you're only changing one amino acid, and you can get a partially functioning protein out of that, like we see in sickle cell anemia. But if you're inserting and shifting the frames and you are changing all the proteins from that insertion point onward, or all the amino acids, and so the, the construction of the protein will be entirely different. An example of a disease or a disorder that comes from an insertion mutation is Huntington's disease, which is a very um, drastic mental and physical deterioration that occurs to a person after they've reached middle age in their 40s typically. Just like insertion mutations, you have deletion mutations where data is missing. And again, it would cause a nonsense mutation or a non-functional protein because from that point onward, all of the coding would be coding for different codons than what was originally designed. Point mutations are concerning just one base. You're, you're changing a base, you're adding one base, or taking away one base. But in chromosomal mutations, you're involving large segments of DNA. Pieces of the chromosome actually break off and reinsert somewhere. This tends to occur during prophase or metaphase, when chromosomes are normally close together. And sometimes we do get some mixing up of chromosomes called crossing over, and this is if, if you're just swapping out pieces from one to the other, then it's not going to cause a mutation. But if it's an unequal sharing, that's when you can run into problems. Also part of chromosomal mutations are the non-disjunction mutations, where chromosomes fail to separate during meiosis one, and some gamete ends up with too many copies of a chromosome and the other gamete not enough. So the first type of chromosomal mutation I want to talk about is inversion where within a particular chromosome, a whole section of DNA is just taken out and flipped, as we have diagrammed down here on this illustration. So this section here just comes out, turns around, and reinserts. Of course, obviously, this is involving large sections of a chromosome containing several genes, at, at least one gene and often several. And one of the cases that we found for hemophilia, a rather severe case of hemophilia, the a fail to have your blood clot properly disorder, is from a chromosomal inversion. 
Sometimes that piece of chromosome does not replace itself back into the original chromosome, but it goes to the other half of the homologous pair. So that you have, as illustrated down here, two copies of this same gene segment in one chromosome. So this is what it looked like originally. The um, one that you know, would lose this section and the other one would get double the dose. The chromosome with the extra gene will probably function normally but may express genes more strongly, which can lead to problems, whereas the other part of the homologous chromosome pair has lost DNA and may not be able to uh, function sufficiently to have a viable organism. They believe that the somatic cells that undergo dupli chromosomal duplications may also be involved in promoting cancer. This may be one of the types of chromosomes um, in, or chromosomal mutations that ends up in causing cancer. And then the third type of change within the chromosome is translocation. And so here the piece of the chromosome inserts on a non-homologous chromosome. It actually goes someplace else. And this has been linked to infertility and a variety of type of cancers and other disorders in humans. And this diagram just shows you, so a piece of chromosome 1 that goes and attaches onto chromosome 11 has been involved in some types of schizophrenia. Um, you can see some of the other types of diseases that are listed here. Most of these are cancer. And then finally, the non-disjunction mutations is when you actually are having the chromosomes not separating, when the homologous chromosomes are normally pulled apart in anaphase 1, in meiosis 1. Um, this does not happen, and so one gamete receives too many chromosomes, and the other gamete does not receive enough. Trisomy 21, otherwise known as Down syndrome, is the most common non-disjunction disorder. There are a couple others that lead to viable um, babies, but this one is the one that is most common. And we'll be talking about Down syndrome a little bit more when we get into the next chapter on human genetics. What causes these mutations in the first place? Well, we've got all of the transcription that's going on to make all the various proteins, and every time your cell divides, whether it be for meiosis or mitosis, things have to be DNA is replicated. And so if there are mistakes that are made, and your body has a number of safeguards built in to try to prevent those mistakes from being a mutation that would be harmful, but DNA transcription mistakes can occur and cause mutations. Probably, though, is what uh, is a more, of more concern is the environmental mutagens, things that cause mutations found in our environment. We know for sure that some things will trigger mutations, cigarette smoking, overexposure to x-rays, ultraviolet radiation, and certain chemicals and heavy metals have been linked to be mutagens, or more specifically, they're often identified as carcinogens as causing cancer. Mutagens may break the DNA, and then when it's in pieces, it may reassemble in an inversion or a duplication or a translocation situation. UV radiation from the sun or x-rays are two mutagens that are known to break apart DNA. Or certain chemicals can, as I said earlier, alter the properties of nucleotides, leading to substitution when DNA is replicated. A nucleotide is read as something that it isn't and the wrong um, base pair is made. So what can you do? Well, if you know, certainly limiting your exposure to any known mutagen or carcinogen is wise, but also eating colorful fruits and vegetables is a beneficial effect not only, you know, for tasty food and good digestion, but they provide things known as antioxidants. And one of the chemicals inside the body, one of the ways that chemicals can work inside your body is because they are oxidizing agents, so they break down bonds between the various bases on your nucleotides or within your DNA because of their oxidizing potential. And so the chemicals in fruits and vegetables serve as antioxidants. They prevent this oxidation from happening. So that covers what I want to talk to you about genetic variation. That gives you an overview of Chapter 14, hopefully setting you up to be ready to read Chapter 15.